Hello conservationists, welcome to chapter 10, Invasive Species with Mrs. Foes. So this chapter we're going to be looking at introduced species who hurt native species, like the Norwegian rat here uh, eating a bird offspring. And then uh, another example would be in Minnesota, there are a lot of lakes, you might have heard of that, it's actually more than 10,000, but what happens if you move your boat or other water equipment from one lake to the other, you can be taking uh, invasive plant species and animals uh, into new lakes. So they're very careful about making sure that everyone rinses off their boat really well and cleans it. Um, in fact, in the summer, if you go to a lake, oftentimes there will be people there checking uh, to make sure that you haven't introduced anything new. So a few definitions to start out with a few terms to clarify what we're discussing here. So let's talk about native versus non-native. So native is a species that came to be found in an area by natural causes. So they made it there on their own. Non-native, they're in an area because of people, anthropogenic causes. So examples here, the wild turkey, native to North America. That's also a great conservation story in Kentucky. Uh, in Bowling Green, for example, 20 years ago, you wouldn't be able to find a wild turkey. Now I see some at least once a week. Um, and the common pheasant is non-native. It We hunt it now. It was introduced from Asia. The only way it's in North America is that humans brought it there. And then you can also have domestic organisms like the chicken. Uh, its ancestors are from Asia, but it's been domesticated, so bred for certain traits like egg laying ability, meat growth, um, disposition, and is here now as a non native species. So sometimes species will come into a new area on their own. That's called a range expansion. So an example of that is this beautiful bird here, the cattle egret. So it started out in different areas of Europe, Africa, and Asia, and it flew across the Atlantic to South America, made its way up to Florida, bred in Florida, and now it's all the way up into Canada. And we consider it native to North America because it did that. We didn't bring it here. It found its way on its own. And a reintroduction is if we had a species here that we've gotten rid of for some reason, like oh, it was overexploited, and people bring it back. So North American bison were reintroduced to several areas, like in South Dakota. Uh, their range used to be huge. Um, it's not as large anymore, but we're bringing it back. Another example would be from our first case study, uh, the Kentucky elk were reintroduced. They were there natively, but they were no longer present because of people, and so people brought them back. So what is an invasive species? An invasive species is an introduced species, so people brought it in, that establishes, so it reproduces, maintains in that area, and has an appreciable impact, an appreciable negative impact on native organisms and ecosystems. So it hurts those species that were already present. So here are my two cats. And I should put my dog on here too because both cats and dogs are invasive. They were brought in by humans and they attack local wildlife. Cats literally kill billions of songbirds every year. Um, dogs can kill them. They can kill uh, rodent species. They have appreciable negative impacts. So what not isn't necessarily discussed in depth in the book, but I think is really important for us to discuss is interspecific interactions. So that's basically how different species interact together uh, so that we can look at the different ways invasive species can interact with native species. Yeah. So in this picture, we see a few types of interactions. We see predation where one's eating another, and then we see competition between those predators that would like to eat. Okay. So oftentimes we'll classify interspecific interactions based on how they affect each other. Do both 
lose? Do both win? Does one win and the other lose? Um, one word that we use wrong in normal day life is symbiosis. So symbiosis does not mean that both benefit. It just means that they're interacting. So if you live in symbiosis with somebody, you interact. It doesn't mean you have a good interaction. It could be a bad interaction. It could be good. So a negative that we're going to look at is competition. So if species eat the same food, if they use the same resources to reproduce, if they use the same type of grass to build their nest, uh, they are competing for the different abiotic and biotic resources. So the things that they use is called their niche. Uh, so if their niches overlap, they're competing. The more they overlap, the more they compete. So what you oftentimes see to avoid competition is specificity. specificity. So here we have three different types of warblers that all use the same tree, but they use different parts of the tree to reduce their competition. So there's the Pauli's competitive exclusion principle that states, so if two species niches are too overlapped, they both can't exist in the same place. So the Virginia's warbler and the orange crowned warbler, they eat the same food, they nest in the same trees. If they were in the same spaces, one would outcompete the other. It's not like they can go to other things and use the other things. So if an invasive species comes in and overlaps too much with a native, they will be in huge competition. So in a mutualism, both species benefit. Uh, a fun example there is this hermit crab and a sea anemone. The sea anemone protects the hermit crab, and then when it eats, uh, it releases its food particles up and the sea anemone gets some. It also allows this sessel or non- moving organism to be able to move. Here we've got a shark and that is a cleaner wrasse. It's this fish that comes up, does this little dance, and then helps pick parasites off of the shark. So it gets to eat and the shark gets less parasites. There is another fish that pretends to be a cleaner wrasse called a blenny. And so it does the dance, it comes up to the shark, the shark doesn't bite it, it just lets it go. And it thinks that it's going to clean, but instead the blenny takes a bite out of the shark and swims away really fast. So that would not be a mutualism. This is probably the most important mutualism in the world. And you probably don't know what it is. Isn't that interesting? So these are plant roots, and this is fungus and bacteria. This is called mycorrhizae. It's the fungus along plant roots that helps fix nitrogen. The plant gives it sugars, and so if a plant doesn't have this mycorrhizae, it doesn't grow well. So all the plants in your backyard, and you looked at the microscopic level at their roots, you would see fungus all along them, allowing for growth. Next, this is my picture. This is from South Africa. This is a kudu. And you can see these birds with red beaks on its back. Those are called oxpeckers. And they were considered a mutualism because the oxpeckers will eat ticks off of different large species. But what they've actually found now is that they're more likely to pick open scabs and uh, harm that large mammal rather than help. And here, another very important mutualism between pollinators and their flowers. So we discussed plant evolution and how angiosperms are flowering plants and that they produce a lot of the goods that we use. And we need pollinators to pollinate, spread those seeds. So in predation, one benefits the predator and the prey does not benefit. So if invasive species are going in and predating upon native species, it's gonna harm them. A fun way that prey help reduce their predation is cryptic coloration. So that's where they blend in. So on this side, we've got a cicada. On that side, you've got an octopus. There's a really cool octopus called a mimic octopus, and you should definitely check out a video of it. It actually mimics other species, so it'll lay flat like a flounder and swim like a flounder. 
It will hide all but two of its arms and make them black and white to resemble a very venomous sea snake. It's really cool. It's in Indonesia. Okay. And so what I'll do with my students is have them pause and see if they can find the different species with cryptic coloration here. Uh, so if you want to play, pause, but I'm going to go through the answers. This is a seahorse. This is a giraffe. It's amazing how close you can be to a giraffe and not actually see it. You'd think you'd be able to find them because they're huge. And once you know something, you're like, oh wow, that's a giraffe. But they blend in really well. This is some sort of worm, some sort of caterpillar. Crocodile. Here you can hardly see it. This is a bug. There's its legs. And a frog or a toad. On the other hand, instead of blending in, you can have warning coloration if you are producing chemicals that be, can be toxic. So this is a very small blue ringed octopus and it's poisonous. If it bites you and you die, it's venomous. If you bite it and you die, it's poisonous. Got lizard, grasshopper, frog. Another defense, which is really fun, is that of mimicry, where two species look very similar, and one will be uh, dangerous, and the other one may or may not be dangerous. Depends on what type of mimicry. So here's two snakes. You might have heard the saying, like, red on black, you're okay, Jack. Red on yellow, you're a dead fellow. So venomous, non-venomous. But if you're a predator, and you've had a negative experience, you're not going to like think about which is which, right? The monarch butterfly eats milkweed, and so it's toxic. So if a bird eats one, it gets sick. And if it sees another monarch, it won't eat it, right? It used to be that we thought that the viceroy just looked like the monarch, but was non-poisonous. But what we're finding now is that it also is. So they both look alike, and a bird only has to eat one to figure out that it shouldn't eat any more. There's a snake, and there's a caterpillar that looks like a snake. And then they can look like non-threatening things. So Katie did oftentimes look like leaves. This moth looks like bird poop. That's pretty fun. Herbivory is also positive negative. So the herbivores are eating plants plants are getting eaten. So plants have some pretty fun uh, defense mechanisms, some of which we find to be delicious, like cinnamon. Uh, so this is acacia. These are both my pictures from South Africa. It's very thorny. The only reason that there's so much of it is elephants don't like to eat it because of its thorns. So there is a bush bark and a lion in acacia. And then a really interesting one where you might not think of it as an invasive species is parasites and pathogens. You're going to do a case study looking at bats and white nose syndrome. That's a fungus that alters the bat's ability to fly and kills them. So it's a very important invasive species that we don't really see unless we actually look at the host, right? So the parasites feed off of a host. They can be bacteria, viruses, fungus, and protists are single-celled organisms. This is a snail. Go to YouTube and watch a zombie snail video. So this snail is infected by parasites. So normally its eye stalks are dark and skinny, but you've got uh, the parasites up in here moving around making it colorful. And so what happens is a snail that would never normally go to the end of a leaf on a bright sunny day does. And so what happens next is the next host for this species is a bird. And so birds come up and eat it, and uh, they get infected. And then they poop, and the snail uh, gets infected, and so forth in a cycle. Another fun one is a fungus that affects ants. Um, and they'll go up and bite leaves and hang there. And then cows will come by and eat them, and that's the next host. There's a virus that affects rats that causes them to go towards cat urine. And so they get eaten by cats and 
that's the next host. It's pretty interesting. If it's out in the nature, a parasitic wasp exists to parasitize it. So if you go outside and look at plants, oftentimes you'll see galls, these thick, um, enlarged portions of leaves or bark or whatever. Uh, those have parasites in there. So let's look at a few examples. This is the zebra mussel that we're really worried about in Minnesota and in Kentucky. Um, so this zebra mussel costs us at least $5 billion annually. So Kentucky, one of the really great things about our streams is that we have a lot of freshwater mussels. And so what happens there is they have great ecosystem functions. They filter water. And so they also have lots of nutrients for things that eat them. Zebra mussels, on the other hand, when they come in, they outcompete the native mussels. They don't filter as well, and they don't have very many nutrients. So they're a definite negative on the other mussels and anything eating them. And you can see that over time, species will go down if you have uh, invasives. Another invasive species would be a predator, so brown tree snake in Guam. So there are a lot of birds on Guam that are now extinct or just extinct on Guam, extirpated. Uh, one of the issues that island species have is generally they haven't evolved with predators for a long time. So many of them are not very scared of predators. They don't have to worry about anything. The kakapau in New Zealand is a good example of this. This is a, a forest dwelling bird that goes on the ground and it is eaten by dogs and cats all the time because it's just so nice and it's not scared. And so there can be greater impacts than just the first level. So like cats, the direct effect is that they eat songbirds, right? But another effect that's indirect is that if there's less songbirds, there's more mosquitoes. Same idea with white nose syndrome and bats. Less bats means more mosquitoes. So how do species get introduced? Uh, intentionally, we put them in our streams like uh, different types of bass that outcompete the native uh, because they grow faster. Uh, pheasants we want to hunt. We think they're pretty. That's how a lot of our plant species are introduced. We plant them and then they expand. Honeysuckle, for example, smells really nice, but it outcompetes uh, native species. And then agriculture, we bring in different species because we want to eat them. Unintentional, they are stowaways. That's how rats got places, escaped pets, or you can like release your pets on purpose into nature. So now let's look at more examples. This is kudzu. You can find it in Kentucky. It goes around different plants and suffocates them. It takes away their light. Uh, humans, and released it here on purpose because we thought it would help with soil erosion. This is Christmas Island, Australia. It's a pretty common example. Crabs help shape the environment. They're the keystone species here. And so they take out new growths. That's why it looks like this. And then when the ants came in, the crabs were inhibited and then you had all this growth more invasives. Burmese python in Florida is a very bad uh, species. They eat lots of natives. They were generally introduced from people not wanting them as pets anymore. This is the European starling. So someone's idea in the 1900s was to have all of Shakespeare's birds released in North America. So they released 100 and now you will see them every day in large flocks. They're brood parasites, so they'll kick eggs out of native species um, and place their own in. They're really bad invasives. In the U.S., there's this thing called the Migratory Bird Act, where you can't shoot like, any birds ever 
unless you have a hunting license. One of the few exceptions is the starling. So they've got this like speckled back. But make sure you know what you're shooting at because there are a lot of blackbirds that look similar. The grackle um, has like a navy head and darker body. Um, so make sure you know what starling, star, starling looks like. This is Australia. You can see they introduced rabbits there, which they didn't really have many mammals, so they did really well. Also Australia, cane toad. And then we have African killer bees, so these really aggressive bees that are moving up into the U.S. And then there's kudzu again. So ways that we can control invasive species. Physical control, you can go in and kill them. Uh, chemical control, like here is an invasive plant species that they're putting chlorine bags on. And then biological control, which is really interesting, using biology to do it. So like for the rabbits, putting in foxes. So in Australia, they introduce foxes, they're like, they're gonna eat all the rabbits, it's gonna be great. They actually ate mostly native species because they were easier to catch. It went terribly. Uh, but the best thing that we can do is invasion prevention. It's far easier to solve a problem that you don't have. Prevent it from happening and you won't have all these other issues. Some legislation, we'll look at that more in chapter 17. Okay, have a great day.